Talking about sex and sexual health is often a minefield filled with cryptic words and taboos. Being misinformed or ignorant of the relationship between sex and sexual health will leave you vulnerable to unplanned pregnancies, HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. How should we be talking about sexual health? And more importantly, when should it start? Hi, I'm Marissa Menech, and you're listening to the Woven Experiences Podcast. Here we share stories around important topics and explore the interconnectedness between ourselves and the world around us. Let's get into it. Today's guest is a fellow podcaster, Naledi Poe. She is the host of Uteronomy, sharing information around masturbation, contraception, menstruation, and overall sexual health for those with uteri. Welcome to the Woven Experience podcast. Thanks so much for being here. So, Naledi, just for the listeners who are unfamiliar, can you give us a kind of like a short snippet of what your podcast is about? Okay, so my podcast is called Uteronomy, uh, the Gospel According to St. Uteri, and it's a play on words because Deuteronomy is a book in the Bible. Um, so I was sort of playing around with words, trying to find a way to best describe what the podcast is about. And it's it's about that. It's literally about uteruses and uteri and vaginas and everything in between so we talk about anything that has to do with that and just the general body it's not limited to people who present as female it's you know we're trying to expand so that we can talk about different things some of the things we've spoken about already are menstruation birth control masturbation so it's sort of on that that sort of part but, but what kind of drove you to create a podcast about this? So I would share information on my personal Instagram page about like periods and menstruation, period pains and all of that, because I was going through the most in that, in that sense. Um, so I spoke about quite a few things on my Instagram stories. I spoke about abortions. I spoke about cervical and ovarian cancer I spoke about endometriosis because Mm. these are things that you know they happen and it's not to say that people aren't speaking about them but none of the people that I've surrounded myself with are speaking about it generally Um, so my experience with endometriosis and you know horrible horrible menstrual pains is what brought me to speak about it and I got such a such a good reception because people would say, well, continue, we want to hear about this, and people would engage, so I'm very, I'm very shy, so I was not going to make a YouTube channel, I don't like to watch myself speak, Uh, but (laughs) listening listening to myself speak is the lesser evil, so I thought, well, podcast is the way to go. Okay, well, Mm -hmm. that's very interesting, starting off on Instagram, we all, well, everyone with you try, obviously, have those type of experiences Mm. but from your experience and the type of feedback that you mentioned you got and so on what challenges across the board or generally that you that you get when when people uh when it comes to people's sexual health you know what kind of stands between them and achieving or getting access to that type of information I think And it's strange because we're in 2020, but I think it's the whole concept of all of it being taboo. You know, you can mention that you, it's your monthlies or you have your time of the month or whatever you want to call it, but we never call it what it is. It's your period, you're menstruating, it's the start of your cycle. And Mm. you also don't call your body parts what they are. So you wouldn't call an elbow anything else. So why would you call a vagina anything else? You know what I mean? Yeah. So what people more than anything were struggling with was calling things by their name. 
I think that was the shock factor of the Instagram stories and the podcast that I was just saying vagina, 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 vagina. <laughs> all over the show <laughs> and it took a lot for me to get there as well you know to saying vagina without being nervous or you know and I still get nervous because it's not a pretty word it's it's not it's not a sexy word but that's the point you know sexual health and that sort of thing it's not just about the act of sex um and the act of, of sex with other people so yeah. people think because it's so taboo, you know, they don't know that other people are experiencing horrible period pains or the reasons why they're experiencing those things, the types of contra- contraception that's available out there. Um, people only know the pill and they don't know about the IUD, the IUS. There are so many things out there, but no one knows because one, your doctor only tells you about the pill and two, no one else is talking about it. So. I think that to sort of sum up answering your question, the things that people were most interested in were calling things what they are and shared experiences. And that way we can learn and we can grow by sharing our experiences. Yeah, I feel, you know, personally, I'm, my parents are also fairly conservative. Uh, not calling what it is and you know, the whole stigmas and taboos around certain topics, it kind of, uh, well, it had an impact on my kind of relationship to my body. Mm -hmm. Is it something that you've experienced or some of your listeners maybe? I still, I absolutely still experience it. Um, So I had started the podcast and actually in, I think it was in July this year, I was doing a promotion for the podcast. Um, and so my mom came and she saw me doing this. So she asked me if she could see the video and I was like, you can see it, but don't be weird. Um, because you know, <laughs> you're so used to, <laughs> everything is like a secret, you know, besides talking about, you know, I need pads or whatever with your mom. And my, my mom is quite mm. open. She is quite open about sex and periods and all of that, but she's still very conservative. So mm. it's, we don't openly talk about these things. And so I felt very shy. I don't know if that's the right word, but I was very shy to show my mom a video of me saying vagina all over the place, you know, and my my sort of, my thing is, hi, my name is Naledi and I like to talk about vaginas. And that's a shock if that's not something you're used to. And I think that's a shock also to our parents. I actually put in, in, one of the episodes, a disclaimer to say, if like you're my parent or my aunt and uncle or whatever, like listen and be educated, but don't be weird around the dinner table. We don't have to talk about it. You know what I mean? And it's because we don't talk about it. So that really has affected, like you say, the image that I have with myself, the image that I have of my body, the things that it can and can't do, the things that I would like to explore. You know, it's still... I say the word vagina all the time, but I'm still very shy about talking about sex. And it's like, well, that's a little bit, it's funny because the one doesn't have to do with the other, but they Mm. all have to do with each other. So it's, it's just, yeah, I I will, I will never talk to my mom about sex. Not yet anyway. Uh, But I will say something about, oh, I have a rash on my vagina. If that's what had, that's, if that's the case, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. I think it's uh, it's because we grew up a kind of uh, with the, with the whole idea of vaginas being sexual organs mm. and reproductive organs, and I think like the the emphasis on that was was to an extent it was no it was no longer part of your body like your toe or your ear. Exactly. It was it was basically uh, just just for one purpose, and it's a secret. It's it's your down there. It's, it's got its own special name, and oh yeah, and it's very you know looking at children. It's very harmful to to call things something else because you know I read a story about a child who was speaking about her uncle eating her cookie, and you know as an adult you can sort of. If you're now telling you this, then you're not you're not at all going to think what you're thinking if it was an adult telling you this. And so mm-hmm. it becomes impossible for children to share the, the things that are happening to them and with them because, one, 
it's a secret place and no one must touch it and no one must see it and no one must talk about it. But two, mm. I'm using the name that you told me to use and then you're not understanding the severity of the situation. Um, mm. So that's also, that that was a big motivator for me um, saying the word vagina and saying the word penis. I don't even like, like people call vaginas pussy and they call penises dicks. And I'm so uncomfortable with those words because it's, Ugh, I think that's more vulgar than vagina and penis, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, being kids, we all had names uh, for our special bits, as you say, for our vaginas and our penises. But, you know, what was your experience? You know, it starts at a young age. What was your experience at school? What kind of sex, what was sex ed like then? At school, as far as I can remember, there was, you know, Education about HIV and AIDS and maybe education about STIs and STDs. But I found that we weren't taught how these things happen. So you know that you can get something called a sexually transmit, transmitted infection. And you can get that if you have sex or if you you know mix saliva with another person. But no one ever says this is what sex is. And mm. parents are also against that happening in school because the thinking is that that's now going to promote kids going and having sex. But mm. I would like to think that you tell them what it is so that they can understand it and you tell them at the level that they're at so that they can understand it so that they can ask questions about it and so that, you know, everyone can become comfortable. But everyone is uncomfortable and so it's not, the, the conversations aren't happening at school and they aren't happening at home. And I had quite a comprehensive sex education from my parents. You know, they, my dad was a bit more cryptic about it, but my mom was very open about, you know, what sex is and why people do it and the circumstances in which people do it and why you shouldn't do it again she's quite conservative so you know before marriage or mm. for a certain age or if you don't have a boyfriend because it's something that that's sacred that you want to do with someone special and that's not necessarily the case but that's the sort of education that I received from my parents so I was lucky in that most people don't have any conversation about sex uh but my mom would tell me you know growing when she was growing up people would fall pregnant and they didn't make the connection that what they did was sex. And as a result of that sex, they fell pregnant. And so if you're not yes. speaking about what it is and what the consequences are, you know, if you just say, stay away from boys, and if you hold a boy's hand, you're going to fall pregnant. Well, then everyone's just going to stop holding hands or hold hands <laughs> um, to <laughs> rebel against it. But then they won't know that when their genitals touch in a certain way, it can cause STIs, STDs, HIV, and and pregnancy. Mm. No, that's very true. No, I also remember, you know, if uh, obviously it's a very tense and nervous, everyone's giggling mm -hmm. type of situation. Um, but people who asked questions, whether they they were funny or or actually just curious, uh, they were often very ridiculed or put on detention. Mm. Yeah. For putting a, a teacher on the spot. And you see then, what's the value of education if you're ostracized for asking questions, whether you're asking them genuinely or you're asking them as a joke, like you say, then there's absolutely no value, then they might as well just not do it at all. Yeah. So talking about this, what, what do you think you would have liked to experience at school? What kind of sexual education did you, would you would have appreciated? I think I think more than anything, I think they should, when they speak about sexual education, it's not just about sex and safe sex and the results of sex. It's what sex is, it's what your sexual organs are, and the purpose that they serve within your own body. Um, so if you don't know that you produce estrogen and you produce progesterone, progesterone and progestogen and you know you don't know that you produce those hormones through your your reproductive organs and so you become an an adult and you have to go on the pill and they're telling you about all these hormones and you have no idea what they're talking about 
So I think Mm. as much as it needs to be biological and clinical, it also needs to be relative. You know, we need to look at it from a social science perspective and I guess it, it's it's not you don't you can't learn sex education the way you learn maths. There needs to be a, a different approach to that. And so my my preferred approach would have been you know a sort of relaxed environment where we sit and we talk when people ask questions. You know, and children love to ask questions, and children love to make reference to things. So if they can sit and ask the questions that are on their mind without being ostracized or laughed at, I guess there'll be some giggling and some laughing. But it needs to start young because children as young as six and seven are touching their own genitals and it's absolutely normal. It's absolutely natural. It's mm. it's it's a way of comforting yourself and it's not necessarily sexual. It's almost never sexual when they're children. So if we were to from a young age talk about what we have and what this means and why one is different from the other. Yeah, normalize these types of conversations and questions. And then if you start like that, then it makes it so much easier once a child is is older to then bring the more advanced conversations in about sex and about, you know, that sort of thing. But now you're bombarding us with this is a vagina and this is a penis and if they touch, you'll get pregnant. And, you know, it's just a shock. Mm. yeah yeah i think language is important especially with children like you said absolutely talking to children and teenagers about sexual health is a vital step in establishing a safe environment it also encourages them to ask questions or raise concerns they might have in fact research shows that children who talk with their parents and know more about these things, are more likely to wait to have sex until they're older and use contraception when they eventually do. People that don't have uteri, is it important for them to know about people who do have uteri, their sexual health? Um, What's your view on that? So I've actually gotten quite a few questions from people without uteri about things uteri related and because they don't know and the thinking is generally that well if you have a penis then you must know all the penis stuff uh but you don't need to know all the vagina stuff or if you have a vagina then you know don't need to know all the penis stuff and Mm. more than anything it's really quite interesting you know I think I was maybe 23 22 23 when I learned all this stuff about penises and about some pe- people, like their penises sit on the one leg and the other one on the other leg, like very interesting things about people. Mm. And, you know, and if my mom's listening, I'm still a virgin until marriage. But, you know, in sex, you don't even, <laughs> you don't even really stop and look at what's going on. Like, what is this thing that you're, that you're dealing with? And so I had to learn myself to, you know, just sit and it's not sexual at all. You sit and you just look at it and you observe and you and you touch everything with consent, of course. And so I think it goes both ways. I have a lot of people without uteri asking questions that are non-sex related, because as much as the big thing is they don't know where the clit is, you know, that's a conversation on its own, but they don't know all the things that can happen in the uterus, in the vagina, and and what the vagina actually is, because the vagina is a part of that entire system in there. So I think we all benefit from asking questions genuinely and openly and getting getting answers in, a, in an open and comfortable and honest way. Yeah. You know, having conversations via podcast and Instagram, you know, it's it's not person to person. And I realize that a lot of people have feel a lot of awkwardness uh, talking one on one about sexual health or sex in general. Mm. Is that what you experience? And how do you think people can move past that to actually have these conversations? I mean, it's always just easy to speak into a microphone or to type into a phone or a computer because 
no one's really listening. But even, you know, speaking um, via podcast, like I also had to get past that initial shyness. But it's honestly just talking about it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be serious conversations. I'm still very, like, I'm very giggly when we talk about sex and, like, I don't know, sex positions or sex toys or I'm very, I'm very, very giggly and very shy and nervous. But the more you do it, the better you feel about it, the more comfortable you feel about it. So it's, it's a strange or it's perceived to be a strange topic of things to speak about, but it's a topic of things that should be spoken about regardless because everyone's doing it or everyone's not doing it, but people want to know about it. Yeah, so basically, you know, practicing speaking about it because we've isolated that kind of conversation to the back of the mind for, you know, one person, you know, usually you allocate it to one person, whether that's your spouse or your partner or if you if you can, your parents, uh, whoever that person is, do you speak about these kind of things? Absolutely. And we're always so interested in what other people think but we don't ask because then we think they're going to think there's something wrong with us or we're strange, but it's, it's really just all in our heads. If you ask a question, chances are people are going to open it honestly and answer it, sorry, honestly and openly. And chances are they were, they were thinking the same thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, on your podcast, you often, you know, incorporate not just the information Mm -hmm. and research that you provide, but kind of you incorporate your own personal experience and you often make reference to that is that you know do you feel vulnerable when you do that um I do I'm I'm quite selective about the information that I do share um and I sort of gauge from people what they want and need to know and that's how I decide what I'm sharing and what I'm not sharing um so being open and honest is important but it's also important to have boundaries for your own for your own sake. Um, and also just, I don't know, there's some things if my parents come across them or if other people come across them, I just don't want them knowing. So there's a lot of things that are very personal and I'm not going to share. But there's a lot of things that are very personal and it's important to share. Yeah, that's a very fine balance. Mm. It's very, it's very. But I think at the end of the day, I look at like sometimes I record whole episodes not that there are many uh that's me shaded myself <laughs> but I, I record whole episodes and then I'm like mm, I'm uncomfortable with people knowing this about me right now and maybe later it will be I'll be happy to share it but for now I'm not going to and that's okay because you know your podcast is so candid and you, you know with your candid conversations I wonder does it reflect the type of conversations you have with your friends do you guys have that candidness or you know are the all the conversations changing in in your generation so I'm quite open with my friends I have like I don't know if everyone has this but I have the one friend that you know when you try something new or you have a cookie, <laughs> you know, text her quickly and be like oh my gosh we tried this in sex and it was so cool or it was so horrible or oh my gosh I tried this toy you should totally try it or mm. even you know and we don't talk every day necessarily but it, it'll be just an update like hi please call the police because my uterus is trying to kill me Um, And I have that one person, which is, it's great. It's an amazing relationship that we have. Um, But I think, so my other friendships are also quite open, but not to that extent. Um, But more than anything, I've seen with my sister. I have a younger sister and she's 19 now. And we've never been, we've never had that sort of relationship where we talk about sex and boys and stuff, mainly because I was uncomfortable about it. you know, you see this person as your little baby sister and now they're growing into an adult and they're doing adult things that you might or might not be doing. And it's it's very uncomfortable. You have to get over it yourself first. But my relationship with my sister has improved so much because we talk about these things. She listens to, to my episodes before I publish them and she says, think about this and think about that. And she gives me feedback from her friends. Um, 
so that's that's great. Um, I'm hoping to expand that further, and it's the same with my sort of you know close friends who are younger than me, who are my sister's age and younger, those close family mm-hmm. friends where they come to me and they're like, "What do you think about this pill?" or how does the morning after pill work? You know, and it's it's shocking because you're like, oh my gosh, the 17 year old is asking me about the morning after pill. What am I gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> but then you have to take a step back and say, well, when you were 17, what did you want to know, and did you have anyone to ask about it? Um, and mm-hmm. I want to, I want to be that big sister for whoever needs that big sister. Um, whether that person is older or younger than me, because it's not, it's it's really not about age. I have people older than me asking me questions of things that, or, or about things that they thought about that they just never got the answer to. Yeah, and normalizing these types of conversations helps to create safe spaces for people to reach out and ask questions and share experiences. Thank you so much for joining me, Naledi. And thank you for being the big sister to those who might need it. Please check out Euteronomy podcast. All links will be provided in the description. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. And be sure to subscribe to this podcast to avoid missing out on any future episodes. I'd appreciate it if you could leave a review. And if you have any thoughts on today's episode or perhaps topics you would like me to touch on, you can contact me via email. A link is provided in the description. I hope today's episode provided some new insights to what it means to be human. And I hope to see you in the next one.